So hello everybody, it's great to see you. It's a honor to be here today in this panel with my distinguished colleagues. I want to start with something that is probably kind of obvious at this point of the day or at this point where we are, we are entering the earth greenhouse effect in way that are totally unprecedented basically in the last million years. We know the global temperatures have increased already by over 1.2 Celsius degree. And we believe that this is a reason of concerns for a wide range of diseases. And uh, I would say the vast majority of the parasitic diseases and a large fraction of the so-called neglected tropical diseases. All these diseases, including the malaria, the dengue, uh, that uh, my colleagues just talked about, share these really important features. They have an important environmental component in their transmission cycle. And so we expect that climate change in its multiple dimension is going to affect either the parasites free living stages or their non-human host. I specifically work a lot on schistosomiasis. Schistosomiasis is probably uh, one of the most important of the so-called neglected tropical diseases. It's present in uh, uh, four continents in 74 countries, uh, affect uh, uh, basically 200 million people, 800 million people at risk. And this specific uh, parasitic diseases has a very interesting life cycle. So it, the life cycles include a, a obligate intermediate host, which happen to be freshwater snails of very specific species. And so basically <clears throat> the people get infected when they step into contaminated water, where there are these free living stages, the cercaria, and infected people <clears throat> release eggs that in contact with the water hatches. And these free living stages, the Mudacidia, swim around and find eventual snails that they got <clears throat> infected. Now, what actually happened is that uh, with free living, free, free, basically uh, stages of the transmission cycle being ectotherms, being unable to thermoregulate, uh, climate change and temperature, of course, is going to have a huge importance. So, what I want to look here is the effect of climate change and schistosomiasis over three different points, the direct effect of temperature on parasites and snail, which is the most obvious one. But I also want to bring attention to other aspects that somehow were referred to in my previous talk, that is the effect of human response to climate change. And what is the effect on transmission risk for schistosomiasis? <clears throat> and also the climate change effects on disease risk that are mediated by a wider ecological community where the parasite is embedded in. So let me go to the first point, just uh, to mention that uh, uh, um, uh, thermal performances curve are, would say, being derived to describe the metabolic, the physiological or demographic response of both the parasite and the snail <coughs> to temperature. <coughs> With this data, it's possible for us to identify the critical thermal thresholds, that is minimum temperature, uh, which for instance, uh, the cercaria are able to swim and the maximum temperature at which they are able to, switch, uh, to swim as well. Now, when we consider the basic uh, critical thermal limit, uh, we can start to do some really basic but super powerful exercise as Anna-Sophie Stensgaard did, for instance, this seminal paper on a review on the schistosomiasis climate change in 2019. She basically identified the mean temperature of the coldest quarter, one of the bioclimatic variables, and the mean temperature of the warmest quarter, and uh, identify the threshold, the maximum thermal threshold for the maximum temperature of the warmest quarter and the minimum temperature for the warmer one. Then from uh, the NTD data sets, she got the location of all the places where we know that schistosomiasis is occurring and plotted there this bioclimatic variable for the two most important species that are schistosoma hematobium and schistosoma mansoni. And as you can see, basically, schistosoma can only transmit in this lower quadrant there, where the temperature is not too high and neither too low when it is cold. The threshold catch really well the maximum thermal tolerance of these two parasites, less well the minimum one because the snails are able also to <clears throat> hibernate, so to speak, and to, to survive uh, the winter 
digging into the map. And so even where temperature is very low during the winter, they might still be able uh, to basically resume their life cycle and transmit schistosomatous. What Anna Sophistemsus did, she took all these places, she projected what minimum and thermal, uh, minimum temperature of the coldest quarter and the maximum temperature of the warmest quarter is going to be at the end of the century. And as we see, everything translates towards the upper right. And the very interesting thing is that there's going to be a bunch of places that were presently too cold for the transmission of schistosomiasis that are going to move into the envelope where transmission may occur. But there's going to be also a lot of places in which the temperature was already at the limit and potentially in the future would be too hot to support the schistosomiasis transmission. In a paper in 2011, Stemsgaard, for instance, did a um, statistical analysis, basically looking at correlation between temperature and the parasite, and identified areas where schisto is expected to increase, all the green area where schistosomiasis is expected not to change dramatically, and blue areas, especially in the tropical area, in the tropical region, where temperature might exceed the maximum thermal tolerance for schistosomiasis. An alternative approach is the one used for instance by Gwen et al. Uh, in a paper in 2021 in which they got uh, the life cycle of schisto. They develop uh, a thermal sensitive mathematical model of schistosomiasis transmission in which they got every single parameter for which data are available and recast the parameter as a function of temperature. For instance, this is the data that L.L. published in 1974 about the relationship between snail egg productions and temperature. So they did it systematically for all the demographic and epidemiological parameters that are reported, for instance, here in these figures of so snail mortality, Miracidia mortality, Sercaria mortality, and so on and so forth. And they basically clamped this together by computing the basic reproduction number, which is a measure of the transmission potential, if you want, of the disease, to look at and, and identify what is the thermal envelope and also the basically thermal optimum. In this specific paper, for instance, thermal optimum is 21.7 Celsius degree, which according to my personal experience and a lot of available data, seems uh, a little bit too low from what we think that optimal thermal temperature might actually occur. And this is might depend upon the type of data that has been used to parameterize the model. And in fact, I just want to mention there are uh, lots of different studies, um, something like more than a hundred, that report tendently an increase in uh, schistosomiasis transmissions, in some cases uncertainties, and a small number of cases in these tropical areas where they're actually projecting a decrease in schistosomiasis transmission. So multiple different points of view. Let me briefly go to my last two points. One is the effect of uh, people response to climate change. And here, what I want to mention is that as a consequence of the increasing frequency of drought and the uh, heat wave uh, and the reduction in precipitation, we expect to see, and we are already observing climate migration and crowding around windy water. And also the other element that is very important that one of the most significant and important response to uh, the drought and the need for water is the construction of dam and water management infrastructure. This is part of a general uh, process, basically, and trend that is happening. Climate change and population growth are basically putting pressure on the production, for instance, of food for feeding a growing humanity. And because of that, we're developing more artificial reservoir. Now, there is an overwhelming difference of a relationship between agriculture, dams, and increase of schistosomiasis. A classic book, uh, one of the seminal um, uh, review by Peter Steinmann that has been shown systematically in this process. This is what actually has been observed, for instance, in Senegal, uh, in the lower basin of the Senegal River at the border with Mauritania, where as a consequence of the construction of, uh, of the Jama Dam in 1985, there has been a, an upsurge of schistosomiasis that we probably have, you know, have seen never in this level and this proportion. And here, 
I won't get into the details, but I want to say that the community and my group specifically has published a series of paper that showing what is the cascading sequence of the event, the construction of dam lead to an increase of schistosomiasis. And the problem, and I finish the second point here with this one, to say that uh, there are, are at basically hundreds of medium-sized dams that are projected to be built in Africa and in South America where there are pockets of schistosomiasis transmission and probably thousands of small reservoirs to support cattle and to support agricultural productions. And so we identify this as one of the critical areas that needs to be investigated. And I have a single slide only on my last point. Uh, that is about the wider ecological community. And I mentioned this specifically because in my simplified cartoon, I have people and one snail that are involved in the transmission of the schistosoma parasites. But when we focus, for instance, just to mention one place in Brazil, we do actually have 10 Bionfinaria species, that, uh, of which only three, Glabrata, Tenagophila, and Straminea, are supposedly involved in the transmission of schistosomiasis. And these species might compete among each other, so they might respond in different way to the challenges provided by climate change. And this is, remains a big area of investigation in which we need to know more. In conclusion, what I want to say is that we generally expect an increase in schistosomiasis transmission risk, especially at the cooler fringes, at the cooler margin of its distribution where temperature was too low so far and might potentially increase. There is going to be the potential decrease in transmission risk in the optus region, although this might compound with behavioral aspects, for instance, of the snails, for which it's not totally clear whether this is what is going to pan out. As was mentioned in, my pre in the previous talk, it's not just temperature. Climate change is not just temperature. The rainfall and flooding, the drought and heat waves, all of them are going to affect a different species of snails in different way. And there is this compound effect of climate change and land use change and changing demography and migration that might also uh, change the basically outlook of the risk for schistosomiasis. And last but not least, this problem will identify the thermal physiology across uh, different schistosoma parasites and species for which very little data is available. And with this, I want to thank you all and to, you know, my wide range of collaborators and uh, the agencies and donors that made this research possible. So thank you very much. Let me...